Okay, as I can tell, he's getting ready, and they're looking at each other. Why don't you introduce him, David? Oh, it's it's Stanley, Matt. You know him by now, mm -hmm. right? Stan, we're hearing, of course, the Beethoven sonatas. Yes, I was so intrigued yesterday with your Glenn Gould resume and conversation and listening to the wonderful Mozart sonata that he did. You liked it very oh, much, you told me. It. Yes, you loved thought it was... It. Like a music box. Mm -hmm. Probably the way Mozart played it. Uh, I don't know about that tempo, but... Uh, I was Mo speaking of the non-legato. Right, the non-legato. Mozart probably, although in letters he talked about legato, probably uh, piano playing at that time had not achieved because of the way the piano itself sounded, its timbre, uh, had not achieved this legato style. Right, in any case, Gould is one of the most fascinating and original minds, Beethoven, I think. Yeah, oh, indeed. Beethoven uh, had said to Czerny, his student, you can't play legato. Now, I think probably it was with uh, Beethoven's time that true legato playing took place. So Gould probably, indeed, has his reasons for playing like that, although it shocked many listeners. Oh, Gould always has his reasons for doing anything, and he substantiates them quite well, although some of the time, I must admit, I don't understand them at all. Well, uh, I think we will hear him again today in the sonata number 10, which is in G major, which is also of the Opus 14 series, composed in 1799 and uh, however I'd like to begin that sonata which you once made a comment to me about that sonata a little outlandish but uh, grandiose I said every program should begin with this sonata <laughs> every recital a pianist yeah well that's amazing uh, it's just delightful it's one of the really marvelous sonatas and people sort of disdain it because they say oh it's an easy sonata no point it's so difficult just the phrasing on absolutely the, on the, the the opening you can spend a lifetime it's exquisite we have uh, a new artist joining the Beethoven series her name Maria Grinberg who is Maria Grinberg I Mar thought I knew everyone but I don't well you were just in Russia and you didn't hear her name no well, she was born in Odessa about 1910 and is one of the most respected of pianists in the Soviet Union. And she has recorded all five Beethoven concertos and all of the 32 piano sonatas. I'll be very anxious to hear it. We will. And here is Opus 14, number one, the first movement.
the first movement of the 10th piano sonata by Beethoven, Maria Grinberg. And Stanley Waldorf, you are, as I expected you would be, in a state that was playing. Yes, it contained everything that any great pianist should have, vitality, lyricism, rhythmic control, drive, and a very sensitive feeling for the harmonic changes. Just an absolutely exquisite performance by an exquisite artist, the first time I've heard her play. Yes, I would advise you to zoom down to the Four Continent Book Corporation and buy the entire set. That's the only place in America you can get it. Well, this is absolutely wonderful piano playing, and, and Matt was right before we came on. He said, you're in for a surprise, Stanley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm starting to develop the impression that the Russians do better with Beethoven piano sonatas than uh, almost any other group, as, uh, you know, to just to make a generalization. Beethoven is, sweeping, a, yeah. Beethoven is a god to the Russian pianists. Has, has been that way from the beginning. You'd probably get a lot of argument on that from the German school and, and the Americans also, uh, who think the Russians take far too many liberties in Beethoven. I tend to agree that I much prefer this than the staid conceptions of simply the giant Beethoven being played as, as something very straight. I really love it. I love this kind of piano playing. I agree. Well, uh, are you ready for Glenn Gould's performance of Opus 14, number one? I am always ready for Glenn Gould.
That was Glenn Gould's wonderful sculptural brand of phrasing, his, his own, totally his own. Oh, I, I agree. Gould is always intriguing, especially when he brings out the accompaniment pattern, sometimes as loud as the melody. Uh, I said to Matt and to you, that's the reason he hums. You have to hear the melody above all of that going on. And I, I wonder what Glenn... Uh, I said it was the Hummer clavier. The Be Hummer clavier, yes. yes. And he makes everything into an epic. There's no doubt about it. The but, smallest piece becomes an epic. The most marvelous thing is in a Gould performance to watch Matt Edwards as he is waiting with an expression of such rapt concentration, and then the humming comes and he's happy. Yes, it's the only time I've seen Matt happy. Let's, uh, let's hear what Glenn Gould uh, says about his humming. It's an amazing transformation, actually. When you compare that with the well-tempered clavier, it doesn't sound like the same piano. There's an old problem. It's not really so much of a problem anymore since we've all grown so accustomed to it here at Columbia, but you are also rather well-known as a vocalist. And we have to go to rather elaborate lengths to keep your vocal performances that accompany your keyboard performances out of the microphone so they don't appear on the final record. Can you tell us or describe to us what function this vocal accompaniment serves while you play? That's very difficult, and it's one of those um, centipedal questions. You know, Schoenberg once said that he would not willingly be asked by any of his composition students exactly why such and such a process served him well, because mm -hmm. it was in danger of making him feel like that centipede who was asked in which order it moved its hundred legs, and afterwards it could move no legs at all. There's something impotent-making about that question. I'm rather afraid of it. I think then you should avoid it. I don't no, want to I'll, take any I'll, chances. I'll, I'll answer it in one paragraph or less. I can't do without it. I would if I could. It's a terrible distraction. I don't like it. I, I would resent any artist whose records I bought indulging himself that way, and I don't see why anyone puts up with it. We do the best we can. We put as many baffles around the piano as we can. I can only say I play very much less well if I don't indulge in a few vocal elaborations. Well, there's obviously some kind of recreative element or generation going on in there while you play. I think there's a wishful thinking aspect, too. That is the way I would like my phrases to be made, and I'm never quite able to do that at the keyboard. Glenn, I noticed you have a very unorthodox method of working, of recording. Uh, most artists, when they come into the studio, have an absolute fixed idea of what they want to do. They've taken a piece, they've played it in concert in front of various audiences and honed it down to a certain style that they feel is right for that piece. They come in and they do it. Now, I've seen sessions where you've come in with music that you obviously know completely and play it in what seems to me five different styles and five different tempi each of them seeming legitimate and then subsequently you go in and you choose from among those you've laid down now, that's very unorthodox yeah well sometimes it's a total inability to make decisions <laughs> i think i take my cue from soap opera actors and actresses who tend to learn their lines the night before and forget them the moment they've done it this sounds a very strange thing to say, but I have, in many cases, come to the studio without the least notion of how I was going to approach the work that we were to play that day. I've mm -hmm. come in perhaps with five or six, as it then seemed to me, equally valid ideas. And um, if we were lucky, and if time permitted, and if the producer had the patience, we would try all five or six of mm -hmm. those possible interpretations. And perhaps none of them worked, in which case we'd come back in a couple of weeks and try a seventh. If two or three did work, we then repair to an editing cubicle within a week or so and um, listen to them. And really, the week, at least, is necessary for some kind of perspective. The judgments that you make a week later are never those that you think you're going to make upon the spot, on the spur of the moment. It never turns out that way. Uh, the things that seem best and most inspired and uh, most spontaneous at the moment are very seldom that. They're usually contrived, they're usually affected, and they're usually That's filled really. with all kinds of musical gadgetry that one doesn't really want in a recording. You need that temporal displacement to really be objective. Uh, right? Absolutely, yeah. That means, then, that, strange to say, part of your artistic and creative process is going on in the editing situation. It's editorial, absolutely. Well, Matt, there is Glenn Gould uh, on his vocalism. Yes, and also, uh, interestingly enough, he has the same feeling about recordings that most of the great pianists of the past had. They did not want one recording to serve as the model for their playing. Yes, of course, it's 
It's heartbreaking afterward, especially when you've changed your conception. Let's go on with the Opus 14, number two, the exquisite first movement of such vernal freshness. It's in G major. It's the 10th Sonata of Beethoven, Berenboim.
Daniel Berenboim performing the Opus 14, number 2 in G major. Stan? Well, Matt said we were doing a little nitpicking, and we explained that, of course, all of these are, are great artists. Just as an observation and a personal point of view. Oh, absolutely. Uh, this, uh, uh, all of these pianists are, are among the, the finest in the world. Yeah, Surely, I, they're just opinions we have, yeah. Again, I, I find this particular performance, I, I think Berenboim is going for a kind of lyricism, which is quite lovely, but I find that the tempo is so slow that the line dies, and some unnecessary milking goes on that, that makes it sound to me, again, personally, rather precious, and sort of destroys a uh, kind of momentum that this piece needs along with the lyricism. The piece needs a momentum first and foremost, and then everything will come out. Did you notice the difference in the passage work between Gould and Berenboim? Yeah, I hate to, to get into this thing of comparing one to another, uh, but you're right, I did notice the difference. Breeds uh, bad things. We're not speaking that way, we're speaking of the wonder of comparison here through our ears. Hoffman, your idol, once said, hearing, just hearing music with ears? No. I want spiritual hearing. And through comparison, we, we arrive at our own personal uh, delineation for our own even time cycle. What tempos in Beethoven sonatas or, or Chopin etudes or whatever work for our system? And then we know by hearing many. Well, if, if Hoffman said it, who am I to disagree? And I'm very happy that he did say it. Uh, there is this thing about the inner clock. We've talked about it before with Courtauld. The inner clock meaning that which is inside of you that gives you the absolute right tempo, even if it's not the tempo that the listener might agree with. He becomes part of that tempo. Uh, of course. Uh, Berenboim sells many recordings. He didn't become a great musician because uh, he's wrong. Arau and Berenboim, they have a... They have a, a point of view. Totally different, a point of view, but a totally different inner clock than the way 
I than than what I have. I mean, I couldn't possibly conceive that sonata in such a stodgy way if uh, I were playing that piece. Neither neither could I, and I I do agree. I was just clarifying for the listening audience that we do, of course, recognize these men for the greatness that they have. Uh, we have a commercial, and then we'll be. We have Richter to play the first movement of the uh, Sonata Number no. Ten of Beethoven. You were just in Russia. How is Richter noted in Soviet Russia? Well, considered the great and original pianist of the Soviet Union, there's no doubt about it. I understand now that he is teaching in Leningrad. Thought he was in Moscow. Well, I did too, and then I heard while I was there that he was in Leningrad. Now I don't know whether he is or isn't because. That's very difficult to know unless you've seen him. Is it true that uh, one of Richter's points of honor as a pianist is that every program will contain a new work that he has learned? That's what I've been told. Of course, we only know what he plays here in the West, and uh, I really can't answer that, to tell you the truth. It's, it's a stunning conception, too, because he plays constantly, to constantly be adding to the repertoire. Let's have the E major sonata. G major. Sorry.
Richter in the first movement of the Opus 14, number two in G major. Very facile performance. I didn't like it at all. Yeah, I, I was saying that, that he, of course, it was a very light performance. For me, again, this goes to the opposite extreme of Berenboim. It's just too fast. And there is an amazing amount of pushing going on, which disturbs the line for yes, me. Yes, pushing, though, in, within the light framework of yeah, his playing. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's, he's Tempo. playing this as a, as a Rococo sonata, yeah. and it's no longer that. There is an intense lyricism underlying this. Yeah. And, of course, when we heard the Ghoul performance, he made the middle section into, in, in, into a monumental sound pattern. Yeah, as I was saying to Matt and to you while we were listening, Richter has this tendency of being the master of tempo fluctuation, which does work in some things. It does not, for me, work in this performance. Let's hear Alfred Brendel in this beautiful movement. <laughs> Thank you. 
Alfred Brendel in some very gentle moments, and again a few stodgy ones. I think that this is one of those sonatas that you must not take the repeat. I agree. Uh, as you said, I, I like this performance very much, and I know Matt adored it. Uh, I think that uh, it just was a little earthborn for me. It didn't, earthbound? Yeah, yeah, earthbound. It didn't sort of fly off. It didn't. Wait till you hear the way Brendel, though, plays the uh, opening movement of the B flat sonata, the next one coming up in uh, Opus 22. Yes. It is just fantastic. Yes, we'll get to that soon. You've mentioned that, and I would be very interested to hear that because it's not one of my favorite sonatas. Let's now have, for our last performance, the Schnabel performance of the Opus 14, number 2 in G major.
And there you have it. That is our performance for the day. Stan? Yeah, the, the line never stops, and yet there is great nuance. The tempo's right. Of course, there's some things one could quibble about, but really, it's a wonderful, wonderful performance by a great, great musician. And remember, those little technical slips were, of course, before the age of editing. Yes, absolutely. And Schnabel hated to record anyway. Maria Grinberg was first, Schnabel last, both my favorites, but I think I would... I would buy the schnabel. And Gould, always interesting. Stan, thanks for coming up, and thank you, Matt, and most of all, I thank you.